Viper! Derek, these players are itching to get going. So why don't we, as very as quick as we can, get into the lineups. What do you uh, make of these players' chances going up against each other? Well, despite a lot of the maths that general players or people on Twitter have been doing about these two players, putting Viper pretty firmly behind yesterday uh, when he was in his winner's interview, still saying he thinks that him and Bunny Hopper have the best conquest lineup that you can build. Right. But I would have to say now Godan with his Recruit Hunter, very strong anti-control deck as well as some other very respectable decks coming up behind with Taunt Druid and Shutterwalk Shaman. I think he's pretty firmly in the lead. Yeah, interestingly, it seems being the underdog today is where you want to be because mm. depending on which statistical analysis you look up, Xiao Ti in our opener was 53 to 55% favored and lost. Yeah. Uh, Jin Su was 56 to 58% favored against Killin and lost. So again, those same stats say that Nalgadan has around a 55 to 45% edge in this matchup. So maybe you just want to be in Viper's shoes here. It's the day of the underdog so far. Absolutely, but that's what makes Hearthstone such a fantastic game. It's uh, the human element as we saw some play from, I think, both series, especially from Xiao Ti, where there were mistakes made that could have lost, uh, led to a victory. Yeah, and I think it's a great time to bring that up because now Gadan here is leading out on the Recruit Hunter. Mm. And this deck in particular has been the downfall for a couple of players who brought it. It had a very good overall win rate into the, yep. in the tournament coming into today, but both Blood Trail and Xiao Ti made some pretty catastrophic mistakes with this deck. Um, Blood Trails was more obvious. Mm -hmm. um, Xiao Ti's was a little more niche, but I think Frodan and Kibler did an excellent job of just explaining why what he did was so wrong. And it really cost them. And I, I feel like, I don't know if you agree, but many of the players who brought Recruit Hunter have just done so because it seemed right as part of their lineup and just haven't put the hours into grinding out the game. I would definitely agree with you because although it runs a lot of minions in the early game that might we suggest to a newcomer that it's just trying to play strength. as a curve deck, uh, that's not really the way the deck plays because everything you do in the early game isn't necessarily to get ahead on board, it's just to stay even, to survive until your seeping Oozlings and Kathrinas can truly dominate the control decks because against the aggressive decks, you're not really supposed to be able su to survive. This Recruit Hunter does terribly against the more aggressive strategies. But in this particular matchup, it's a very interesting one to be looking at because now Gadan, or sorry, Viper, I believe yesterday, his final game that qualified him through to the top eight was this exact matchup. Yep. It's a matchup where uh, there's a lot of discrepancies in the online uh, trackable percentages between the two decks. At lower ranks, it is um, Warlock favored if you look at the statistics. Okay. When you start to filter for only Legend games, then Hunter moves out ahead. Um, which again, just goes to hammer home that idea that Hunter is a deck that gives you what you put in. You have to practice the deck and really be able to play it at a high level to squeeze out the good matchups where you can. And I don't want to say this uh, for certain, but could this be the first even Warlock game we've seen where turn one is not life tap so far this tournament? It seems it so rarely happens. And what do you think Viper's thinking here is to go for the Stubborn Gastropod? It's obviously very vulnerable to a candle shot, but maybe he just wasn't expecting to see it. I mean, I think he just looks at the type of hand he has here with, you know, coin two into two into potentially life tap and two again into Twilight Drake. And you said, hey, Recruit Hunter isn't necessarily a deck that you play as a curve deck. Well, maybe Viper considers even Warlock as a deck that you do in this matchup just to make sure that you're playing the aggressor because actually Hunter's late game will beat you if it gets to that point. That's right. And when I think about it a little bit more, What's the alternative? The two ways you can play even Warlock are playing out your small minions, trying to go a little bit more curvy, or go for one big minion, at which point you are very vulnerable to a Hunter's Mark, where yep. if you go for the smaller minions, there's a pretty decent chance that you actually manage to come out ahead on board. It is, however, kind of unfortunate for Viper that now Godan has had a very nice 1, 2, 3, 4 I curve wonder. to start the game. Right. And now both the Acidic Ooze and the Sun Fury Protector are just totally neutered yeah. on board against this single Misha. I do like the call, though, that, you know, even if you had Tap Tap Giant available, is it even right to go for it, right? Yeah. Because there's Deadly Shot as well. You didn't even mention double Hunter's Mark and a Deadly Shot that can then force that out so straight away. And you're just going to end up taking, what, 15, 20 damage in the process of doing that from Hunter? 
And the upside of winning the board early on with your bunch of small minions is actually pretty drastic, I would say, because if they are then in a situation where they just drop a seeping oozling on turn six and you can keep going face, they might have to make some very awkward plays, trading their devil swords into your minions rather than going face, right? which could be very beneficial in the later stages of the game. Algadam with very little consideration just drops the Houndmaster Shore here. You like it over the Serenite Chain Gang, Darren? I mean, it just feels like it's less vulnerable to pretty much everything Viper could throw down on the following turn. Hellfire, although unlikely to come down on just a Chain Gang, is a consideration. Against a Drake or a Shroom Brewer or even a Hooked Reaver, the stats on uh, the uh, Houndmaster Shore feel a little bit more reliable here. I can see it. Also gives him the ability to, um, you know, with Serenite Chain Gang potentially rushing, get usage out of that as a trading tool before yeah. it gets caught in a Hellfire option. Very with Twilight Drake coming down, obviously not an attractive option, but still it's something to consider. And things with Vipers. I'm starting to see his plan come together because even in this relatively bad case scenario where his opponent curved out very beautifully from turns one through five, He's still got a good amount of cards on hand. He yep. hasn't taken too much damage. He's got a Spellbreaker because he started tapping a little bit more in the mid stages of the game. And now Godan's just starting to run out of cards. Yeah, and he could still theoretically, if he wanted to here, I'm sure he won't play a turn six Mountain Giant. Um, right. <laughs> but he still has the option now to shut down perhaps Seeping Oozling on the following turn just a little bit by uh, Hellfiring away this board state because yep. a rushing seep Seeping Oozling is a terrifying proposition. I think it is just simply a little bit too scary. He can't taunt up a minion that has less than four attack, thus keeping the Seeping Oozling alive for a turn and then spell breakering it. So while I love the hesitation here from Viper, I think the play kind of just has to be Hellfire. Agreed. It's, n it's still not fantastic because your opponent still gets to develop a 5-4 ahead of yep. the play, but at least then you can respond with Spellbreaker and shut it down just that little bit. And then you have the board contested in terms of stat line as well. And Viper has some pretty respectable defensive options with both Shroombra and the Spellstone in particular ready to come down and start wrestling this back. He's got pretty much all kinds of minions you need. He's got the tech cards in Spellbreaker to deal with Nalgadan's main game plan. He's got the healing to keep him alive, and he's also got some of his own threats in Mountain Giant and Gen Greymane. Viper could start to turn this around surprisingly quickly. Yeah, with that one power play now shut down, Algadan doesn't really have any of the unfair stuff happening. He doesn't have Stitch Tracker to pick up an option of whatever he wants. He doesn't have the Silver Vanguard. He doesn't have Oozling number two. He doesn't have Katharina. Yeah. He just has, you know, individual large minions, just Big Hunter, basically, from right. this point, until he <laughs> picks up one of those options. That's not a deck that works particularly well. It's not particularly vulnerable to even Warlock strategies, because it's not like against Rogue, where if you just throw down one big minion when you're behind on board, they sap it, they Valspine it, or even against Druid now, where they can just naturalize it. Uh, the even Warlock doesn't really have too many cards like uh, Siphon Soul or something that are being played to oh, deal with one big minion. I all can almost promise you that chat is apoplectic right now. A hunter just chose not to press their hero power. You can immediately see why though, right? The yep. life tap comes out from Viper, takes him down to 17. The hero power would have taken him down to 15. Now Gadam wants none of that hooked Reaver nonsense right now. He wants to have this be a weak turn from Viper, and then he can just develop a large eight drop ahead of the board, preferably that Lich King, doing everything uh, he can to make sure Viper has a weak turn. Exactly right. Now Gadan, good game knowledge or matchup understanding here, or not necessarily general matchup understanding, but adaptive thinking to this situation where he realizes hero power never closes out the game in this scenario. He's dead every time if he loses board control. At the moment, his hand still looking a bit awkward. The fact that Viper will very likely develop some kind of a threat here, be it through the Mountain Giant we see in hand or a potential Dread Infernal from where Nalgadan is sitting as well. I suppose at least for Nalgadan, the, the small buff from Leok that rarely seems to come into effect could be pretty nice with the Charged Devil Saw here. God, this is awkward. I, I mean, this should not be a bad feeling for Nalgadan. A giant just hit the board and he has both of his anti-giant cards in his hand, Hunter's Mark and Deadly Shot. The Hunter's Mark 
he can't use really effectively because it's of the nerf to one mana. He can't mm. just now drop a Lich King alongside it. The Deadly Shot, he doesn't have a nice way to take care of the Sun Fury Protector and avoid the 50-50 option. So despite having his two best answers in his deck to this Mountain Giant, it's still a really ugly turn for the Argentinian. I wonder. I just don't know how to play this. Like, if he goes for the deadly <laughs> shot here, to if he, he could go for the 50-50. I'm just going to admit, guys, I've got no idea. It's just, it's so difficult. Everything feels so bad. It's If he went for the 50-50, the oh. upside isn't even that big because he doesn't get to develop something of his own on the same turn. If he just goes for charge Devil Saw, that's one of his massive threats just gone from the hand. How do you feel about this hero power not being used, by the way? Because now it's just life tap for Viper himself to be able to activate his own Hooked Reaver. It stops double hooked Reaver as a play coming down, which is, it's not completely absurd. I, I we think... had a long discussion backstage about the merits of playing around specifically double hooked Reaver in a certain spot. Actually, it doesn't just play around double hooked Reaver. It plays around hooked Reaver plus any four drop, which I think makes it still That's very quite true. valid yes. because hooked Reaver Shroombra, hooked Reaver Spellstone, so hooked Reaver Twilight Drake, so whatever you want. I think Nalgodan here is still realizing if he's going to win, he's probably going to be winning by a pretty wide margin by having a giant minion stick on the board. That is a great point, yeah. I mean, it's one of the natural things to abuse about the even deck, right, is that on even turns, yeah. they have so many double up options, right? Turn four, they can play double two drops a lot of the time. Turn eight, they can play double fours a lot of the time. And so, yeah, I think that's a great catch on your part and probably still a very good decision from Malgadan in the long run. I would definitely agree with you. Now for Nalgadan, starting to find some of the slightly more juicy options. But still, another Spellbreaker knocking you out. He has to be afraid because one more big tempo swing in Viper's favor kind of feels like it would be irreparable board loss. I yeah, don't wonder. feel like it's an oozling turn. Yeah, I was t trying to just debate in my head between the Devil Saur and the Lich King. I still think Nalgadan is just holding on to a little bit of a pipe dream that he might be able to get this Lich King down uncontested at some point in the near future. And that's what's kind of leading him down this Devil Saw path here. But I honestly don't hate just seeing Lich King come down here. Just challenge yeah. the board one for one, get your, uh, your Death Knight card and move on from there. I mean, it's something like that has to happen because Nalgadan is, even just in terms of damage, from where he's sitting, not that far off. So going for Lich King, hoping your opponent has no healing and getting Death Coil or getting Army of the Dead for a bunch of big minions being ripped from the deck. There were a few good options there. Hmm. Now for Viper, multiple very nice options here with Spellstone, kind of the trump card at the moment because it does deal very nicely with the majority of minions that could come down from right. Nalgadan. And again, very little burst damage in the deck outside of something like Seeping Oozling into Play Dead or King Crush itself. But even then, I think Vibe here is too good to pass it up. Every minion he can stick on the board is a big victory. Yeah, alongside the Shroom Brewer just makes so much sense. Um, slightly interested in the uh, face heal here because the Spellstone was already pulling him way out of range of any you know King Crush nonsense or just yeah. being whittled down by hero powers. Um, but I guess Viper uses that heal to face to just give himself permission to be aggressive himself and leave the Leoc up on board. Yeah, it does leave him more vulnerable to something like uh, flanking strike, I guess, is the main thing I'm looking at. But then for his, from where Viper's sitting, he's realizing the only decent minion that Naogadan can develop alongside that would be exactly Seeping Oozling. So by not going face, he would be playing around a removal card and exactly Seeping Oozling. And so in the long run, I think I like going on the aggressive here. He realizes he is allowed to be the aggressor quite handily. There's an 8-1 on board right now, Derek. Yep. And there's a Dread Infernal in Viper's hand. I'm not seeing the connection. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me dumb it down for you. <laughs> And now that's the second Charge Devil Saw drawn for Nalgadan, right? And that is a Lich King in hand as well. So Vanguard is... Silver Vanguard's just dead. Or is not drawing any minions off the Death Rattle. Which means if Nalgadan did hit that Death Rattle off the Seeping Oozling, it wouldn't even matter if it gets silenced or not in this scenario. 
Well then, well then, well then. King Crush still remaining. Gets Kathrena off the Usling. Yeah. Which would Grizzly still surviving as well? True. But is that even good? Like, <laughs> it's so likely to be met with Spellbreaker or I imagine, yeah, the Black Knight in Viper's deck as well. And there's a few cards that have been in hand for a little while, so you have to be suspecting one of them. And again, there's a 50% just complete failure rate, at which point you just die if now Godan hits the Silver Vanguard. So he's just trying to get something off the Lich King here that can keep him alive, but it seems to me like there's very little that could even do that. Yeah, you mentioned the Spellbreaker, and if the Spellbreaker is going to shut down your Oozling play, it's also going to shut down your uh, Lich King. I'd have some debate about whether the Lich King was the winning turn there from Nalgadan. They were both very low win rate plays. The debate is about which finds you that small out a little bit more often. Maybe for me it's the Oozling, we'll see, but it was a pretty poor draw, I think, in the, in the end from Nalgadan and from Viper, just a little bit of inspiration in the way that he played the early game against the Hunter deck. That's exactly what I want to raise it, because it can feel like in the late game there wasn't really much Nalgodan could do, but that was a direct success uh, on Viper's part, because even though he didn't completely dominate the early game, the effect was he didn't get crushed by small minions, which can sometimes happen. Any kind of Hunter deck that runs one drops and the Hunter hero power can just kill you very quickly indeed. So some very inspired play there from Viper in, you know, Coin two drop on turn one for an even warlock. Not a line of play I would expect yeah. to see very much at all, but working out fantastically for him here. Well, we can wait and see whether Viper has any more inspired play for us in store right after this. I wanted to bring a lineup that beats most of the control decks. I think the Hunter is really good versus control decks, and it's kind of underrated from the people. Well, not this, I think it does, it does good. That's why I bring it here. Yeah. I have uh, Umbra in my, in my deck. I think it's pretty good versus control decks, and some people don't realize that. We will see this weekend. Before the tournament, I, I couldn't get any information about Yuji or Blue Trail or my other group opponents. So I prepared for the tournament uh, like, like if I didn't know my opponents. I think for the lineup that Ray Spring, uh, the deck adapt very well. And we have another member from the Latin American and Brazilian community that's going to be playing on the global stage. He's been amazing in, in Brazil. He's been the best player in Brazil for a long time too. I, I guess the hard work pays off and we are here now. Some people just go by, okay, it's a mathematical problem. There's always one answer that's the right answer, the right call, the right decks. But figuring it out is not easy. And I'm probably one of the guys that wants to do something different, not just go with everyone expects, try to counter, try to beat what people bring. Viper takes it three to two. A lot of people made like those statistics um, about who's gonna make it out of groups, who's gonna win and so on and they just took HSV play stats and decks and whatsoever, but playing control decks like Mage, Shadowbox Shaman and so on, if you play them well and you face the matchups you want to face, they are like way better compared to the statistics you're just gonna get by looking at ladder. 
I cannot bring the same stuff as everyone else and then expect to win. I have to do something different to overcome them. Welcome back, guys. One game to zero here. Viper with some very unconventional even lock play manages to edge out the Recruit Hunter from Nalgadan and Recruit Hunter, as we mentioned, has been a little bit of an Achilles heel for some of the players here, but really because of their own mechanical play from what we've seen. Whereas from Nalgadan, I feel like it was strong mechanical play from Viper that really made the difference. But enough about the matchups we just saw. Nalgadan is going to run it back with the Recruit Hunter, determined to restore the good name of this deck. He's up against Shudderwok, Shaman, Darak. Initial thoughts on this matchup? Uh, I think for Nalgadan, while, as you correctly stated, due to Viper's great play, he was struggling in the last game, still his his Hunter is in such a good spot to take a win this series. I would be very surprised if he lines it up uh, every time until he wins that he doesn't take a win with it against both the Control Mage and the Shudderwalk Shaman. They are simply too slow, though, though they both have incredibly strong late game scenarios with Shudderwalk and Frostage Jaina respectively, they will just be dead to stonking great dinosaurs before they can do any of that. Heckin' big dinos. Heckin' large lizards, yeah. So you're saying um, both those decks you mentioned, uh, Shaman and the Control Mage, they both actually have disruption tools, Hex and Polymorph, to be able to counteract some of the death rattles. You're saying that's not enough to challenge, like the hunter can play around that kind of thing? I think pretty generally, yes. You have obviously Play Dead knocking about in there, which has no real counterplay outside of Skulking Geist, I suppose, just to de destroy it completely, which is, uh, you know, it could come into effect. I think there is... Uh, a Geist in uh, the the Mage only, not the Shadowwalk for Viper, but that could be an effect. But generally, you can just get the Seeping Oozling to activate so efficiently, and you don't even necessarily have to have that to activate it. Silver Vanguard and Katrina are not bad cards in their own right. To right, put them in your deck really doesn't hurt you all too much at all. We see this uh, slightly unconventional these days, I would say, list of Shadowwalk Shaman from Viper. Uh, Murmuring Elemental, no Keleseth, Wild Pyromancer for anti aggro, and the one copy of the Life Drinker, which is the tech that he shares with Bunny Hopper. No great surprise because they share all 120 cards in their lineup. So it's, it's unconventional, I will say now, although this kind of was the list when the deck first appeared because actually Rage was one of the yep. first people to really have success with it. And he was playing one Life Drinker, Murmuring Elemental, no Zola. It was very similar to what we're seeing here, but very quickly that Keleseth build took over. It did indeed. And I really don't want to say that is necessarily the best build, but for this tournament, I feel like Viper's line of thinking is very strong indeed because he predicted there would be a fair few slow control decks against which Murmuring Elemental is fantastic because you just want to give yourself the absolute highest chance possible of getting back a Shudderwalk for one mana back to your hand after you play it, which Murmuring Elemental gives you a 100% chance of. Uh, so, and with the Pyromancers in there as well, still kind of giving him a little bit of game against the aggressive strategies if they were to be knocking about there as well. So a good hedging of his bets, I would say, with this build of the deck. And it's looking to be... Yeah, you know, getting off to a respectable start. He's got Wild Pyro picking up the Acolyte after. May have made him a little bit sad that he just threw it out onto the board, but still with the possibility to draw a good amount of cards. I mean, it's a throwback to his even Warlock opening, right? It's, yeah. it's a very high-powered utility card in his hand in Wild Pyromancer. He just jams it out there, just contesting early, making sure he doesn't take you know big chunks of chip damage from these oh, early game aggression time. minions from Hunter. And it baffles me. Sorry, thinking about like the no Keleseth list, that you know, the, the Lightning Storm deck where you're trying to draw all 30 cards just doesn't play Blood Mage that long. It, it, just, it just staggers me. I guess. There's just not that many ways that it's useful though. It draws a card. It does draw a card. It's such a, it, it's such a tight deck list though. Like they're cutting one Lightning Storm even has to feel pretty bad. But it's a fair point. Maybe you should test it out. Sometime. I did. Well, I remember watching uh, Zole play a list. I think that she had like double loot hoarder, blood mage Thanos in it, and right. it was it was just draw your deck and then okay. do the combo. Like that was that was the goal, and it was it worked very well over a small sample size, but I think fell off fairly quickly for them, which is uh, why they moved away from it. But still, I think it's still worth a little bit of further experimentation. But never mind all that nonsense. There is an acolyte on the pain on the board that is going to be able to start farming from Viper. And I was going to say, as you were saying, you might be a little bit sad 
that he drew it after playing the Pyromancer. The counterpoint to that was if he just played it there, which he went ahead and did, what's the counterplay from the Hunter in that spot? There's really very little. I think it would be pretty much exactly coin into flanking strike, at which point your opponents use the coin on something that isn't Seeping Oozling or Kathrina. Like right. you're very, very happy and also, with uh, that exchange indeed. I guess a one-off deadly shot is a punish as well. And then very again, fair. Yeah. still, it's a, you'd rather probably get your Acolyte oh, deadly shotted than say your big Grumble turn that you yeah. go for. They just deadly shot your Grumble because that's actually often a turn where you can buy back some tempo as yeah. the, the Shaman. Alpha Viper, the eternal question with Shadowhawk Shaman, which four drop is better? Against the Houndmaster Shaw. They're both pretty equally oh, underwhelming, to be time. honest. Yeah. Life Drinker, better or worse, I guess, against Flanking Strike, I guess, is a question. You could make the argument either way. I think initially people would jump in and say, well, of course, Life Drinker's worse against yeah. Flanking Strike. It's just a 3-3. If you play a Saranite Chain Gang, it they Flanking Strike your 2-3, and then you have a 2-3 against the 3-3 that's on board. Yeah. So it's really not a whole lot better. Now, Viper, very, very difficult question. I would have to imagine that the Hex has to be reserved for something more threatening than a Houndmaster, sure. It's not... I think this is something that I Im still find myself suffering to, is it's a strong active effect minion that always I just think it has to be killed off with the likes of Fandral, Lyra, Auctioneer. They're all bundled together into must kill this as quick as possible. But against a Houndmaster, sure, if you don't actually have that much stuff on board, or anything on board, there's not really any downside to leaving it right. up. Yeah. The difference between give your minions rush and give your minions charge is just night and day. Yeah. Right? That it introduces some failure rate for the card at least. And I think you're right. I think the nature of how play dead works, because you were talking about how a big dynamic in the matchup is that now Gidan can use play dead to kind of avoid hex, yeah. right? To to make it a non-factor. But you know, play deading your own minion is not like naturalizing your own minion. It's not like dark pacting your own minion. That minion is still there with its death rattle mm. still in play. So you still need to hex it yeah. after they have played dead. You will just, however, be taking a tremendous beating in the meanwhile. Yes, you will. As now for now, Gadan, he has Silver Vanguard and played play deads in hand. So for the moment, as long as he doesn't end up drawing Katharina, he's still in a good spot. But again, as with every recruit deck, you do run into that pretty decent possibility that your deck just doesn't do what it's supposed to do. The cards come in the wrong order. Viper does not look too enthused with this game right now. Although, saying that, I can't really remember yeah. a time when Viper has looked particularly enthused with anything. When he won, he was like very close to being enthused. <laughs> just a little corner of the mouth just cracked the tiniest little smile. I mean, you choke, but yeah, yes. that was pretty much what happened. Yeah. Oh, As now, again, good matchup with the standing oh, from Viper. I think oh, realizing the 100% activation on Shudderwog doesn't really matter. You're under way too much pressure in the mid to late stages of the game. So just locking down the board right now, and giving himself the maximum amount of time as possible before he is forced into playing Volcano feels like a very strong play to me. It's time to go for now Gadan. The coin play dead combo is going to come out and he can absolutely bomb chain from here until the rest of the game with the hand makeup that he has. Gets another charge Devil Saw. Now has rush and charge. Just considering the way he trades this over. Yeah, I think I like this. Getting the damage through to face is really, really nice because he's got a lot of pressure in hand. And he can just start to close out the game incredibly quickly, or at the very least, force Viper to make plays that he really does not want to. When was this totem played? This is a big issue right now. Count the health on board. There's 16 by my count. Right? 6, 13, 14, trade 16. It. He can trade the 1-1 one, one off, which gets him out of it. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Even with like Hex Volcano, because he wants one, to still two, deal two, with that yeah. Oozling, he's still fine. I think oh, it's probably still okay to be uh, hero powering in this instance, because if you do manage to hit exactly a taunt, mm -hmm. that could save you a pretty tremendous amount of health. 
Yeah, it's definitely not a cut and dry matchup. There are some yep. matchups where I solemnly believe you never press totem oh, as I a agree. shaman. But this is one where a, a zero two can do a lot of work for you if it has taunt yep. for sure. And so, if, I mean, if you look in the other scenarios, taunt just saves you health. It's good. One one you can trade off in the case of volcano. Yeah. And spell power. Spell damage only adds one health exactly. to the board. Exactly. Yeah. Now for Viper, we can talk about totems as much as we want, but in the immediate, he has to find some kind of an answer to this giant dinosaur that's hitting him in the face. But totems are interesting, okay? There's literally a dinosaur with electric for its body on the board. And what's your point? You're such a nerd. The most interesting discussion we've had all week is what the art on a stone claw totem was. It, it created a heated debate, whether it was a <laughs> snake, it was a murloc wrapped around a totem. It's that... definitively a murloc behind no a regular totem. It is. That's exactly what it is. We looked it up. A lot of people do think it's a snake, though. Surprisingly. Yeah, TJ. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> now for Nalgodan again. Just trying to make the strongest play he can onto the board for the moment. There was, I suppose, some consideration to actually saving that play dead. Or oh, actually, no, the, the Silver Vanguard doesn't do anything. The Charged Devil Saw has come right. out of the deck. This is just a 3 3. Yep. Ah. Oh. That's really bad. But I suppose for Viper, he does not know how bad this is. He'll have an inkling, maybe, that the, those two those two far left cards, pretty much the same as last game, a Charged Devil Saw and a Lich King that uh, Nalgadan's just been holding on to for a while, but I don't think you can get the read. There's two of them there. Maybe one of them you attribute to being an 8-drop that's in hand. Yeah. Um, but like I said, you know, Nalgadan doesn't necessarily need the uh, the cheat methods at this point. Like He's just able to bomb chain from hand pretty much from this point anyway, which could just be good enough to get him there. but. Especially with Viper having to use that Volcano on a previous turn. It's such a big win for him. But a key interaction here that we probably still haven't talked about enough is that Lich King running into the Black Knight from Viper as well. Yeah, and these are exactly the kind of uh, tempo swings that Viper needs to be pulling this because he does not need them to obviously just smork his opponent down and win through board, but it will simply keep him alive. Now that Nalgadan, the only actual charge in his deck now is King Crush. Everything else is rush or taunt minions left behind. Yeah. So Viper should be able to do a pretty good job, I would argue here, at just surviving on the board. Well, there's a Lich King in play, and there's a Black Knight in your hand. I'm not seeing the connection. <laughs> Let me die down for you. <laughs> hmm. I still think back to the other day when Admirable just lost his mind when he remembered how Ancestral <laughs> Healing Black Knight worked. Yeah. None Again, the Viper taking his time as one always should with Hearthstone. The perfect turn is you see a good play at the start, but then you spend the whole rest of your turn convincing yourself why you could be wrong. I think it's a dangerous line to walk, though, like taking too long, because I it's weird, a smart Hearthstone player can almost always outsmart themselves. You can almost always give yourself a reason why the obvious play is bad, because there's just so many variables yeah. to consider in Hearthstone. Um, so I am a little bit of a subscriber to just trusting your instincts, you know, putting a lot of work into your, your practice sessions and then getting very, very comfortable with situations. I'm not saying play your turns in three seconds, but I think sometimes stretching out every turn to 75 seconds plus That's fair. can just be to your detriment. I mean, I think we very arguably have seen that from Viper so far in the Summer Championships with his Control Mage play in general, where he made some plays where, you know, specific scenarios, he comes out slightly better than if he'd just gone with the much less greedy board clear. Where's my... We still have Katharina the whole Katharina time. Derek, the fool, I trusted you. Shifting the blame all the way over to the <laughs> left here. Fair enough. <laughs> now, however, it does nothing. Hmm. Most importantly, there is still that crush that we were talking about, though. So the Katharina very much does do something. Yeah. 
and I believe still a Witchwood Grizzly in the deck as well, which is kind of bad for Nalgadan here, actually. He does not want to get the slower minion. He just wants to start turning this up as quickly as possible, because while Viper has been, you know, keeping on pretty well so far this game, he's still ending up in a situation where, without the Shudderwalk in hand, his hand really doesn't do all that much quite yet. We could see Glacial Shard Grumble. Glacial Shard is the most obvious play I'm looking at on this turn, just to try and slow down everything his opponent is looking to do. But then he's still in a pretty scary situation, right? Dark Spirit! From the Hagatha and not going Glacial Shard either just yet. I think, yeah, potentially he's saving up. He does want to do that Glacial Shard Grumble, Glacial Shard turn, but he's, by setting it up this way, he's willing to invest six health from this uh, Katharina hitting him in the face into turning that Shard Grumble Shard turn into generating spells from Hagatha on top of it, which Very is good a, point. a fair investment. Yeah. And I suppose for the meanwhile, this does a pretty similar job, actually, because as long as that Death Rattle from Katharina is not activated in any kind of a scary fashion quite yet, he's still looking to be in a respectable position. Wow. That's a pretty good zombie. Yup. Plus three health or plus three attack. Pick your poison, now good on. Obviously going to be thinking about the break points for Volcano in this scenario. I think he can't quite get himself out of range at the moment. I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> nice joke, Dick. <laughs> Two untargetable, horrible, disgusting, obnoxious minions on board. And yeah, now you draw your Earth job. Sure. Viper, as you mentioned, the benefit of saving Shard Grumble Shard on this turn. Having a big effect if he can get any kind of a decent spell in this scenario, or even anything cheap to potentially uh, combo with the Bog Shaper that we see in the deck on a later turn as well would be very beneficial. Right. And I think it's potentially just too high risk for him to go Volcano here, right? Like, we can see Volcano would actually be fine here with the King Rush being drawn, just yep. clearing away these minions and getting a Witchwood Grizzly out onto the board for now. It's a very low pressure minion that he doesn't have to worry about. Viper doesn't have the luxury of knowing that as he stores up some kind of bizarre Leroy OTK <laughs> in his hand off the, the off the uh, Hagatha. Must uh, he he is scared though, of course, of that King Crush coming down if he volcanoed yeah. this board, and then he's just taking eight from the big old dinosaur. And the benefit of this play is on the following turn, he can do basically what you just suggested, but trading in first. That yeah. means he could summon any beast from the deck, then go with the volcano, even with Earth Shocks and Rock Bites weapons if he needs to as well to very decidedly make sure he has enough attack to clear off the board. It's not the easiest first pick I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I think... Probably just take the cheap one, right? Yeah, Hyena, just because it's cheap. And again, you've still got a couple of beasts knocking about with Flanking Strike and Animal Companion. Can make it a little bit nicer for you. Yep. Charge Devil Sword just to straight up trade, which means that uh, at least on the surface, Viper is unable to pop open the Katharina before uh, committing to a Lightning Storm or Volcano type right. play. But these Earth Shocks and Rock Biters, Whew. at least the Rock Biter weapons are going to do some serious work here for Viper. Yeah, very, very nice play of just being able to stick it onto the Glacial Shard, see if there even is a beast whatsoever. Because I think in this scenario, even if it is the Witchwood Grizzly, which we now see, just go with a rock biter weapon of his own, only taking three damage and clearing off the board. Yes. Some debate as to whether that's worth it though, because the Witchwood Grizzly itself is, I guess, twice as likely to survive as the, um, the Vicious Fledgling if he just rips the volcano because of the 12, 12 yep. health versus six. So maybe the guarantee board click isn't absolutely necessary, but. The counter argument to that is what else yeah. are you doing with a rock fire weapon in this matchup, right? Exactly. It's I mean if you're having to hit a huffer with it or something, that's already a huge amount of damage you're taking that you'd much rather get with an earth shot an earth shock. As this game, man, it's looked at multiple times like it's been over either way. Now go down with very strong mid game, slowing down, but Deathstalker Rex are pulling things back somewhat in his favor. And Viper, I mean he's only a shudder walk away, I would argue, at this point, from being in a fantastic position. Right.
did take the Arthur. So that was a really ugly opener from mm. the, the first pick. Yeah. I have to be honest, I was looking at the Emerald Hive Queen just for the, again, the cheapest, just the highest amount of stats you can throw down on the board. Yeah. And maybe he thinks he needs, I don't know, some kind of a miracle from the Arthur's Death Knight card, but I would argue he's not in that bad of a scenario. I don't know. It's kind of spooky to take Emerald Hive Queen in that position, I think. Like, I I think, like, getting really, really deep down into it, it probably never punishes you, but that you can't help looking at that with the nine mana King Crush that you have in hand and just start thinking about horrible scenarios where you get punished <laughs> because you have an Emerald Hive Queen on the board. I can understand the thinking. I'm not necessarily yeah, yeah, sure yeah. it's right, and I'm kind of with you for sure. But and that's something that we, you know, we were talking about that you do see a lot in tournament plays. Players going with safer plays than they usually would. Again, not even necessarily calling it wrong because there's obvious benefits of going with the Arthas instead of the Emerald Hive Queen. But it is simply less likely to go wrong, you even though the decide. upside could be a bit lower. Other my here is pretty great on the uh, Wild Pyromancer. This is one of the big reasons why Wild Pyromancer is much more fringe in other decks than it is in Priest. Because other decks don't have Power Worship, yeah. which makes your Wild Pyromancer a lot more difficult to use. But uh, they see Earthen Might doing essentially the same job as Power Word Shield does in Priest, which is just leaving the Pyromancer al alive for long enough to get multiple activations off. That's right. It's what Powered Shield, Commanding, Shout, and Equality, the three cards that allow you to play right. Wild Pyro. But again here for now, Gatan, with that King Crush oh. knocking about in hand, he's getting remarkably close to just finishing out the game through pure damage. Now he needs to be thinking, this 5-1 on board, is it actually worth killing off with one of my removal spells? Because if Viper were to throw down a taunt in pretty much exactly Saranite Chain Gang, Nalgadan wants to have some kind of an option to clear the path for King Crush on a following turn. I just feel like, I feel like it just makes it too difficult for you to develop if you don't kill it. It's just a 5-1. It's, it's almost immediately challenging everything you want to do this turn. And I guess if you develop a 3-3 three, three on this turn, it's kind of doing the same thing. Yeah, we would kind of had this turn. exact debate yeah. with like the Light Drinker versus Saranite Chain Gang turn, right? Like, it's just very similar holding a flanking strike as it is to just playing it and getting the 3-3 three, three on the board. Still here for Viper, just managing to get the cards that are keeping him in this game, scraping through at the moment. And while in the, in the immediate, he is in a pretty poor position, I may be making it sound like he's in a worse position than he is, because again, as soon as Shudderwalk is found, yeah. he probably just wins. Right. And I just, I just want to put myself in Viper's shoes here. Like, what are you feeling at this point? Because it feels like almost his work has been done in the matchup at mm. this point, and he's just really waiting for that Shudderwalk draw. He's done everything that he could possibly need to do. And he's just begging his deck to cooperate with it. Absolutely. And even this turn, it looked so obvious with Lightning Storm being picked up that you just go with it. But then you're thinking, I can't play Shadowwalk next turn if I draw it. Yeah. It's less cards to combo with Bog Shaper if I play my cards out here, which he wants to be able to play from hand to draw through his deck to find that Shadowwalk. So many difficult things to think about, but he's just in too bad of a situation if he doesn't lock down the board for the next turn or two. maybe take umbrage with that turn. I think maybe this was the turn where you had to accept small possibilities of losing the game because your opponent has, what, two Builder Beasts stored in hand that they haven't played yet. Mm -hmm. They're going to make a third this turn and then any other miscellaneous cards in the remaining cards that are minions, right? Like, are they ever generating a board that's not so much pressure that it kills you over the next two turns? Because that's what you're asking for. Because if you draw Shadow Walk now, it's a dead card for one turn. You can't yeah. play it. So are your chances of winning this game better than the one in nine of just waiting to see and drawing Shadowwalk the next turn? I think very possibly, because with the minions that were there on board, at, in a best case scenario, your Saranite Chain Gangs are being overkilled by one damage. Whereas the zombies that are in hand, I think there's a pretty decent chance that they end up soaking up four, five, six damage, maybe even a King Crush in the absolute best case scenario. Because it's not always the case that Nalgadan will get 
such fantastic options off of the zombies. There's a lot of them though. Any rush immediately, before you even start to look at the real high rolls, like, you know, Cave Hydra rush and all that kind of madness. Healing Rain is at least a stalling technique from Viper, and I guess that Healing Rain being in the deck does uh, add a little bit of redundancy and gives uh, credence to his line of play, but it's the turn now where Viper essentially did nothing, and now Gadan immediately senses that. He's going for the throat now with the King Crush play. Crush has been waiting, salivating, wanting to get in his eight damage the entire game in hand for now Gadan. But now Gadan didn't think eight was enough. He's waiting for an opportunity where he could do 16. Oh, that's just it. The collective heart stopped of the room. Shudderwalk off the far side would have been huge for Viper, but instead it's now Gadan who does restore a little bit of pomp and circumstance to Hunter's good name, picks up a win with that Recruit Hunter down. Man, oh man, I was not expecting that to be anywhere near so close. This Recruit Hunter, that towards the start of the Summer Championships, was doing very well. Was we dominating. predicted yeah. that it would do very well indeed. Is now starting to show some very real, real weaknesses due in part to, through certain players, a little bit of misplaying, we would argue. Yeah. But they're from now, Gadan. Giving it his all, but Viper so close still to taking that game with what I would argue was a pretty well played game of Hearthstone on the Shadowwalk. Still throwing out his threats very aggressively. No nonsense with too conservative play, holding things back for the best case scenario. Just using his minions to keep him alive. But the Shadowwalk just wasn't there. Yeah, well, I think it's about time for my favorite time of the day. It's the time where we check in with Gamer Sensei's, Sensei's Rosti for some profiles on some top plays from the top players in this tournament. In this video, I'm going to profile Viper, who recently earned his spot as one of the European representatives in the 2018 HCT Summer Championship. Viper has been a part of the Hearthstone Pro scene since 2016, when he earned top 8 in that year's Summer Championship, and in 2018, Viper's enjoying another breakout year, including multiple high ladder finishes, a top 8 in HCT Oslo, and most recently, his qualification for the Summer Championship. Viper's a great player to follow because he's notorious for playing the hardest decks. Today, we're going to take a look at one of his best plays from the recent HCT Summer Playoffs that earned Viper his spot in the Summer Championship. Let's hop right into Game 2 of the Summer Playoffs Decider match between Viper and Faley. Faley's piloting Control Warlock against, you guessed it, Viper's signature Miracle Rogue. It's Viper's turn three, and there are just so many possible plays this turn. At first glance, the best option is to coin out a four drop for value. But which one to play? Elven Minstrel or Faldori Strider? Well, you guessed it. Viper just plays an uncomboed SI7 agent and passes. Wait, wait, what? This play is actually really clever. Viper understands the importance of coin and Miracle Rogue. He wants to keep this card up as long as possible for a critical turn. And he can just play Faldori Strider next turn. But what about Elven Minstrel? Viper realizes the scariest card Faley can play next turn is Mountain Giant. And so playing SI7 now is just a better answer. If Faley does play Mountain Giant, then Viper can go 4 mana minion, coin, cold blood, and use his dagger to kill it. And if Faley doesn't play Mountain Giant, then Viper gets to save the coin and instead play an on-curve Faldori Strider. In fact, Faley does have the giant, which is perfectly answered by Viper just as he planned. It's incredible game knowledge like this that earned Viper his spot in the Summer Championship. This has been our profile of Viper for the HCT Summer Championship. Please join me in wishing him the best of luck in the tournament. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, brought to you by the coaches at Gamer Sensei, please visit playhardstone.com slash esports for more of the well-played series and all things Hearthstone esports. Well played! 2017 Hearthstone World Champion! This will be, I think, the first APAC tour stop for season two. I am cheering for Staz. Oh, 好像突然很多人都在台湾的人都认识
It's a bunch of smart, cool people that you want to hang out with. Gia, you need to tell us where it's good. Follow your nose. With the decks line up, I don't think he ever gets there as a thing. That's it. Wait, wait, that's that's going to do oh it. Oh my gosh. Took a little bit. Welcome back, everybody. You can see some Nalgadan fans in the audience rooting for the man who just tied up the series to become the first South American representative to make it to the World Championship. The crowd have been amazing all week, and now we are getting very close to the conclusion, Darok. Hopefully not just for this series, but for the whole tournament, because I can't wait to crown a champion. I cannot either, and it's going to be a pretty intriguing match to get things going. Recently, uh, DreamHack Summer, some of the craziest games that I had the pleasure of casting were Shudderwalk Shaman Mirrors. Some truly absurd stuff can occur in these matchups. And as always with Mirrors, it's very, very important who ends up taking this series, because Nalgadan taking a pretty expected win with his recruit hunter Viper with the even warlock. This is starting to get down to crunch time. One victory here could mean all the difference in the world. So how does the mirror matchup work there? Is it just an arms race to draw cards? Is there other places where you can find little little edges and little small percentages? I mean, it's kind of a, a dual pronged attack you need to be making. The primary arm is obviously drawing cards. That's number one, as Sotl beautifully demonstrates with his arm. The second one is trying to give yourself the most likely and the best Shudderwalk to activate as possible. And there's a couple of ways you can obviously do that if you have Murmuring Elemental in your deck as Viper does. Going for a play like Murmuring Elemental into Grumble on the same turn is obviously primarily what you're moving towards. Whereas for Nalgadan on the other side with Emmett's Jungle Hunter in his deck, if he can find that, it's obviously fantastic because it will give him the quickest Shudderwalk in all likelihood, but it will destroy some of the valuable battle cries that can go alongside it. Like, for example, in his deck, he has a Burmering Elemental of his own, or the Glacial Shards as well. So the Shudderwalk might be a little bit less powerful. As in this game, once again, Viper showing his kind of signature playstyle with these <laughs> decks of just playing the green card. Hey, I mean, you guys just all watched a two-minute breakdown analysis from Rosti, where essentially the message was play your three drop on three, <laughs> and Viper definitely subscribes to that theory. He's playing his one on one and his two on two. That's just that's just Hearthstone right there, Derek. And just look how it's worked out. Now Gudan had no fantastic play on that turn. If he goes Manatide, it's munched e uh, instantly by the Wild Pyromancer. And even if he goes for that Acolyte, it's only drawing one card anyway. I just love munching mana tides. Mm. Yeah, you can definitely see the snowball effect. You know, the, the Pyromancer on turn two, I think, was an absolute given for yep. the, the reasons that you gave. That's just good understanding of the matchup. The Glacial Shard on one may be a little debatable, and I think the big swing point is that he has the second one in hand right now, because there are times where you want to Glacial Shard, for example, your opponent's Grumble on the turn where they go for it. Um, but just playing it on one, didn't really have downside to Viper. It's not doesn't really have upside either. It's just one mana needs to be spent at some point in this game to gla gla get Glacial Shard into what? the Battle Cry pool. Why not now? Exactly. And not only to get it into the Battle Cry pool, just to get it out of your hand. One of the main ways that this matchup can go wrong is when you simply have too many cards in hand. You have Acolyte of Pain, Manatide Totem in your deck. Overdraw is a real factor, especially after Hagatha has been played, which is why I fully expect and fully hope that for both of these players, Hagatha just never gets played throughout this game. You simply do not need it for your win condition. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's people play the Murmuring Elemental version, and one of the first breakdowns that you know caster or a player explain the differences between the deck will always give is that the Murmuring Elemental gives you a 100% yeah. infinite Shudderwatt combination. Actually, not yes. true. Yeah, yeah. Not true if you have played Hagatha. That yeah. introduces a <laughs> tiny failure rate into the pool where uh, you, mi you miss the uh, grumble sequencing on the first activation. Yep. And then Hagatha goes off last yep. after all the Saradite chain gangs, putting all of your Shudderwalks to three health. Then on the second Shudderwalk activation, Hagatha is the very first thing to happen, kills all your Shudderwalks, and job done. I'm just going to straight up say that if that happens to either of these players, they've deserved to have that happen <laughs> to them. You do not play Hagatha in this matchup. No, you're fair. It's fair.
Because, I mean, like you said, that's a secondary way in which Hagatha can mess with you. But the primary way is you just have too many cards in hand. If you are not, if you don't have any space to bounce back Grumbles to your hand, it usually ends up the situation where it uh, has to be Zola and Hagatha, because then you bounce back like the nine mana Shadowhawk to your hand, uh, or you bounce back a Totem or something with the Grumble effect. I. When this deck first appeared, I, I made a tweet saying that I kind of like feared for casting this deck just because of how hard it is to explain anything in any kind of certain terms. Yeah. You want an example of that? Just listen to the last 45 <laughs> seconds of what we were talking about. Like, you imagine oh, like just a, a rank 20 super casual player trying to work out what the hell we just said? It's just It was just gibberish. Yeah, it's such a, a weird esoteric matchup where none of the usual laws of Hearthstone apply because you're not really fighting for tempo to win the board through board control. You don't want cards in your hand from Hagatha. Like, gaining spells is often an objectively bad thing. Yeah. The Viper kind of <laughs> trying to keep it nice and simple, still just playing the cards he can from his hand. Yeah. If you want the, the absolute TLDR version of what we've been talking about this whole time, it's activate your murmuring with your grumble, play your battle prize, keep your hand empty, don't play hanger. That is basically the matchup in a nutshell. Pretty much. As with a lot of the control decks at the moment, there are just certain rules you have to follow uh, to be playing at a decent base level, like in a control mage mirror or something, waiting with your Alana until they can't play Dragon's Fury because they have no spells in the deck, things like that. Uh, that you just have to know, which obviously both of these players, having brought Shadowwalk Shaman to this tournament, will have learnt the rules. So it's the little creative differences in the style of play that will be making all the difference. And so far from Viper, it looks like he's coming up pretty well, denying a good amount of card draw from his opponent, and already with a decent amount of the pretty important battle cries in his hand. Actually, with pretty much all of them. Not far off. Yeah. Light Drinker on board, he has Saranai, he has, this is his second Glacial Shard, and Grumble and Shudderwalk themselves, they just sat on the left-hand side of the board, uh, the hand. Really that murmuring elemental that he's missing for the perfect pieces of the puzzle. And then in that scenario, you have to start thinking, you know, murmuring elemental is not necessary no. for the combo, it's just uh, to give yourself the highest insurance chance. So against a very slow deck like Control Mage, you would pretty much always wait for that, because then the only way you lose is if your Shudderwalk activates in the wrong order. Whereas here for Viper, if his opponent starts to pick up his own card draw, as we see here, things start to slip away from him. Viper could very well just let rip with, say, a Grumble right here to bounce back the Shadow, uh, the Saranite Chain Gangs to hand, which means you have more Saranite Chain Gang activations oh, before the potential Grumble to come down. Yeah, if you're not going to go infinite, then playing more copies of Saranite Chain Gang, that is your ultimate insurance policy. Yeah. If you've if you played one Chain Gang, it's a 50-50 that your Shudderwalk is going to bounce back to the hand and be reusable, and then that increases incrementally as you put more copies of the Saranite in hand. So yes, it's looking like a pretty solid Grumble turn right now. The issue is that it becomes a little bit tricky to deal with that Mana Tide if he wants to go Grumble. Can go ahead and just Earthshock it, but then he's not redeveloping one of these key minions. I don't think I mind it. I think just any play that dumps cards out of his hand is perfectly fine. I mean, even going with the coin, because with another Saranite Chain Gang in hand, he's probably not going to consider going for Shadowwalk on the following turn, especially because the Grumble would bring back Saranite Chain Gangs before it brings back Shadowwalks in themselves. So he wants to. It's probably the point I'm trying to make is that it will be two turns before his own Shadowwalk goes off. I knew there was a point in there somewhere. I was oh, just, I was just hush. waiting for it. How was that? It was a compliment. It's a twisted British sardonic version <laughs> of a compliment. Is that as close as I'm gonna get? Yes. It's like yesterday your tweet was oh, like, wonder. "I've had a headache all day, but here's this guy," <laughs> and I was in the background, which no, is the nicest thing you've ever said to me. I think no implication was <laughs> what you inferred. I cannot possibly be held responsible. Now for Nalgradan, making that play that we've been mentioning throughout so far in this game of Murmuring Elemental into Shudderwalk to get that one, oh, into Grumble, sorry, one mana Murmuring Elemental yep. ready to go for when he does find a Shudderwalk of his own, but at the moment, it's simply not there. I wonder. For Viper now, it's 
very much just a zero-sum game of does he feel rushed at any point in this game? Essentially, Viper just has to tune his antennae to Nalgadan's ability to play Shudder Walk himself, right? If he ever feels like Nalgadan is getting close, he can go for his own Shudder Walk without the guaranteed option. And to, while that's still a poss an impossibility for Nalgadan, he can just potentially choose to wait because as long as he's got the coin, he can still draw Murmuring Elemental and Murmuring Elemental oh, coin and Shudder Walk himself for the 100% guarantee. That is very true, but it looks to me here like know, Viper fine. is just Forget going off. He's I got said. Grumble on the board. So in the worst case scenario, he still gets Grumble back to his hand. Uh, just like that, yeah. As it does activate first. And so now for Viper, he's making a gamble here that Viper will not be able to clear off both Shudderwalks on this turn. Whereas for now, Godan, if he is able to do so, the combo is just dead for Viper. I am alarmed by that play from Viper. I I don't know what like feeling he picked up from the other side of the board that he had to be in a rush. Hmm. He's got a stack of Saranite Chain Gangs in his hand that first and foremost just increase his odds so much. Man, it's, okay, so on the previous turn, like Nalgadan has played pretty much everything he needs to to play a Shudder Walk on the following turn. But given that he bounced back a Murmuring Elemental into his hand, exactly. exactly, would he go for that given that he has on the following turn the absolute 100% chance? And while this is a big risk here for Viper, it looks at the moment like it might be paying off for him. Oh, no, the Hagatha's there. Yeah. Dark Viper has just lost his Shudder Walks. The Grumble Bounce does nothing if he has no ability to keep infiniting the Shudder Walk. And you saw Viper there just give a little expression and lean back in his chair. And he has to have known that was a possibility. He knows if Hagatha is in hand that it nukes his board, yeah? yeah. Because he knows the Murmuring Elemental is present. What he has done here, I suppose, is forced his opponent into playing Hagatha, which is a small benefit in your favor. But when you have no Shudder Walk of your own, Viper's only real chance here is just dominating board control so entirely. Which he could do in a major fashion. We could see like a double chain gang grumble into playing eight chain gangs. As I think we are getting a good idea as to truly how long this could possibly go on. <laughs> If we were ever going to reach the end of whatever this is, it's now. Pyromancer, Lightning Bolt, Farsight, Healing Rain, all in hand. Healing Rain can actually pick up an extra proc off uh, while Pyromancer quite uniquely. There we go. Farsight is going to get ripped. And we're starting to see some emotion here from Viper shaking his head, looking to the side. I think he's starting to see that maybe he just took too big of a risk. Because obviously, in this matchup, getting the first Shudder Walk online is probably the single most important thing you can do. Oh, of course. But Naogadan's plays, at least to me from where I was sitting, didn't suggest that he was going to go for that on the following turn. Right. I think Viper could have made the assumption that he had the ability just to wait for a little bit longer. I think he just didn't account for Murmuring Elemental Hagatha. Viper just staring at hand, trying to divine some kind of game plan here. I mean, at the moment for me, it's looking to be Hagatha into Blazing Invocation into another Shudderwalk, which seems rather optimistic, I think it's fair to say. You found it, though. <laughs> there is the owl. Or I suppose as a, a slightly more realistic option, again, dominating the board control. Yeah. It's not likely to happen, but it's not completely absurd. The removal of Shudderwalk Shaman does have its limits. It's true. He does just have to keep loading up the board and hoping that he gets there eventually. But Frost Shot can stall here for Nalgadan. Farsight is more card draw that he's been lacking for a couple of turns. He has that cheap mana tide, two incredibly cheap mana tides in yeah. hand here to really start power cycling his deck now. 
Shudder. He's going to run into some of those hand size issues that we've been talking about. And there is that six mana Shudder Walk. Nalgadon's Murmuring Elemental is gone, though. So remember, yep. now there is that failure rate involved for Nalgadon. But crucially, he has the Hagatha Battlecry in his own Shudder Walk, Ooh. which, as well as being a downside for him, is a huge upside right now because of the ball clear effect. Yeah. Hmm. So with, I believe, only one, only one Saranite Chain Gang activation in the pool at the moment. It would be for him pretty much just a 50-50 at the moment, yeah, as to whether he would get a Shadow Walk back to his hand. Um, I'm going to make a call here. I feel like now I just ran out of thinking time yeah. that turn, and then he just did stuff. Yeah. Just stuff that made sense. There were too many options that turn, and he just tried to make some play that wasn't tragic to the point where he just ended up dying, which honestly might just be good enough to get him through this game. It would definitely appear that way with no Zola in his deck, and obviously the Murmuring Elemental having already been used. Having been forced out by Viper, it is worth pointing out it was... Yeah, all right. You know, if you want to be really glass half full about it. I'm being incredibly optimistic here, yeah. Viper, because he has to be if he's going to be winning this game. Obviously, with no Shadow Walk left to him, it's very unlikely. But I suppose plan A here is try and smork his I opponent down, care. dominate the board control. After that, just hope his opponent's Shadow Walk fails, because as it currently stands for me, I think Nalgodan can get at best a 66% chance to return a Shadow Walk to his hand. Mm -hmm. And that's what this deck is all about in the slow control matchups, maximizing your odds of getting right. back to your hand. Which makes you wonder, you know, Nalgadan actually has quite aggressively cycled with Farsights and so on uh, to get to his Shadow Walk. Was a better plan, perhaps, just to wait out and clear this board uh, piece by piece and then get into a position where you you just let Viper die to fatigue as opposed to pushing yourself ahead into fatigue. So if you hit the stalemate, you're going to potentially end up... Viper is simply... Oh, sorry, Nalgadan letting rip with the Volcano before going for Earthshock on the Acolyte of Pain, and it goes in the worst possible scenario for him, I suppose, in getting three cards drawn for his opponent. I think he wants to. I think that's exactly... He wants to fatigue. I think that's exactly part of uh, Nalgadan's plan here because if his Shudder Walk fails, then it's a fatigue game, right? A then both decks don't work. Lit. So I think Draws that's potentially playing around that eventuality. As he gets oh! Rumble first, his own ones fail oh, well! My God. What is happening in this game? This is insane. On top of it all, it's to now Earthshock this 7 1. It's only 9 health on board, which means Viper's Volcano, even just the Lightning Storm, some of the time can answer this board. And now, Darek, I, it's a fatigue game. It's a fatigue game. You were exactly right. Drawing three cards for his opponent has kept Nalgadan in the game here. I was just talking about it, that he was ripping those far sights on the previous turn. Of course, it seemingly paid out because he hit the Shudder Walk with one of the far sides and brought it down to six health, which gave him that chance to win the game immediately. But I think, you know, recognizing he was compensating for that by then volcanoing the Acolyte, it's actually a very inspired piece of play to give himself, to cover exactly this eventuality that he's found himself in. So now all of a sudden, as I was saying, with Hagatha going from a card you'd never want to play in the matchup, Viper wants to find it as quick as <laughs> yes! he possibly can because it just gives him more stuff to throw down onto the board. I don't think I've ever seen a Shadow Walk Shaman mirror like this before. You made two statements coming into this mirror. <laughs> Derek. You want to draw cards? No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. You made two statements. You said that in history, some of the craziest games that you've cast have been Shadow Walk Shaman mirrors and that the person who loses often deserves it. We know that the first one of those is true. Yeah. This is insane. We can debate until the cows come home about whether the second is, you know, Viper's aggressive shudder walking, Nalgadan drawing cards and then trying to force fatigue back the other way with the volcano. In the meantime, 
a spell damage totem just had to come down to rub the salt into the wound for Nalgadar, meaning Storm was a guaranteed clear on all those six threes. And now this is a very, very silly game between two incredibly toothless decks just trying to out-fatigue the other. And if we take a look at the the threats that are left in the deck, as these two basically just become mid-range decks, I suppose. With Mid-range decks? I mean, what else is there? They're winning through just trying to get something to stick on board. There's Bog Shaper for Viper, which while he doesn't want to draw too many cards at the moment, he very quickly won't have any minions left in his deck to draw with Bog Shaper as there he does it pick it up right off the top, and he can just throw it down at some point in the later stages of the game, just as a body. Yeah, he's picking up the absolute boy here, but he's not going to generate it just yet because he knows there are still options like Volcano available to Nalgadan. And with a one-card deficit here, you know, even potentially just this 1-1 one, one Searing Totem chipping away every turn for the rest of the game could make the difference. But it's Viper calculating that he can win this game off this stalemate from this position. One card ahead, healing rain still in hand, and one damage a turn. Viper thinks he's ahead. Both players are doing nothing. And when a game is going to fatigue and both players are doing nothing, one, one of damage. you is wrong. One of you is always wrong. Yes. Perplexing. Exactly. And if you look on Nalgadan's side here, while he does have, I suppose, the superior removal for the moment in case Viper does actually throw anything down. <laughs> Until Viper decides to throw down some kind of a minion, Nalgodan cannot do anything with his removal, so the onus is on Viper, I think, here at the moment, to do the first thing. And if he doesn't do that, the way it currently stands, I think he's winning. I do too. Because it turns out one Searing Totem is the superior hero power at the moment. <laughs> yup. Yup. I'm sorry, but like, this is exactly what I'm saying. You can't both do nothing. One of you is incorrect. That yeah. storm has been correct for the last two turns. It's just Viper worked it out before now Gidan did. And now Viper has to just wait around, redevelop some threats. He's just going to eventually get that 1 1 Searing Total back on the board again, and then he's good. So a couple of options available now for Nalgadan. I'm trying to think, is there any downside of having a frog on your opponent's side of the board? It's such absurdly small stuff like that that Just can make the difference. taking up a board space? So it, I don't know. It's something. It absorbs a damage from Volcano. I mean, Dimly lit. I'm, I'm struggling, but I don't think there's anything there. I think for Nalgadan, it's still just trying to remove as much as he can until eventually he draws all cards in his deck that cost three or less and can eventually throw down Hemet. But when Hemet he does, threat, yeah. Viper gets a Hex just to throw down. Unlucky. <laughs> None this is it now, just kind of one threat a turn if you want to call them threats. You know, Viper still has a Murmuring Elemental as a 1-1 one, one if he really wants, and he still has a Wild Pyromancer as a 3-2. As long as he can just keep playing one, any source of damage, it honestly doesn't matter. Yeah. An amount of damage greater than zero on board is yeah. game winning for Viper from this position. Perplexing. But then on the other side for Nalgadan, we've seen the immediate benefit of totems represented in the extra three damage or so that a Searing Totem got through. But Nalgadan eventually could find some very important spells here that Viper does not currently have access to without his Hagatha. Yep. I'm talking something like Healing Rain in Fatigue would be absolutely massive. A Spellstone to copy his Hemet, something silly like that. Although that would probably never be allowed to happen. Cryostasis. A Cryostasis. It's going to land on that Pyromancer. And I've seen this card be good off Hagatha surprisingly often. Just on your own minions. Just making a big thing in a fatigue situation like this. It doesn't matter if it's frozen. It still needs to get dealt with at some point. 
as it looks to me like Volcano is the play for Viper. He knows, as he will be keeping track of any threats in his opponent's deck, that Hemet is still knocking about. And he doesn't want to Volcano his opponent's minions when he's got something on board. So I love this play of Volcano in even just one pathetic minion from his opponent. Glacial Shard is a great pickup because now that activates the Sandbinder without drawing a card. Yeah. That cycles Ooh. into... Uh, is that Spirit? It's Ancestral, Ancestral Spirit, right? Spirit, yeah. Which, if you can bait it's out the copy big. of Hex, is really, really nice. Right. But yeah, the Glacial Shard draw, Sandbinder itself got activated. That's now playable without drawing a card. That cycles into a spell. And just Glacial Shard itself is then just another minion that can be played and cycle into a card. Now Gadan is, this is the swing now where he's starting to take control. Whoa! Spirit Echo as well. That is Ancestral That's so Spirit much value. for all of his minions. But now hand size is disgusting oh. for now Gadan. Well, I mean, when he's in fatigue, that doesn't make any difference. Sure. And here making the play of, I guess, trying to bait out the Hex kind of from his opponent. So maybe a Hemet can stick in combination with the Spirit Echoes. I feel like Life Drinker would have been better to pair with the Spirit Echo long term because Spirit Echo actually rebounds to your hand, right? Whereas Ancestral Spirit actually puts it in place. So then you get just another six health swing off the Life Drinker that goes back into your hand. Worth thinking about. It is definitely worth just thinking about. Just about everything in the world is worth yeah. thinking about right now because that's just where we are with yeah. this game of Hearthstone. But then the, the other side of that for Nalgadan is by playing two mana spell here, he frees up room in his hand, which is kind of relevant with still a couple of cards left to come. Uh, playing a 6-6 six, six Hemet from his hand uh, with the Spirit Echoes is still very nice. And again, it might bait out the Hex from his opponent if he's lucky. Or, I mean, I shouldn't even say lucky. If he can win the game of chicken, it's all just, right. it's, it's not lucky at all at this point. It's just trying to read your opponent's mind. What will they play? Healing Rain now picked up for Nalgadan as well. And now the stalemate has swung. Now Gadan looks like he's in control because that healing rain was a big upside for Viper. Now Gadan still had that remaining, and as long as he didn't burn it, which was a possibility when you yeah. had Hagatha activated and you were drawing things like Ancestral Spirit and uh, Spirit Echo in particular, as long as he didn't burn it, that was going to be the great equalizer. And again, he just needed to recognize that that ridiculous stalemate that Viper created with just a 1 1 Searing Totem on the board. He. <gasps> <laughs> All right, drop everything because that, I believe, if my card art perception is correct, is the Blazing Invocation. I believe it is. And I mean, even if he can't get Shudderhawk in the most insane of scenarios, it's still a minion. It's something to throw down on the board, which is so good. You must decide. And while I do expect, as he's going for Lightning Bolt on this turn, thus giving himself a little bit more space in hand. Yep. He is down to seven cards now, which means he will get two of these back, all three of these back if they were to all die this turn and just burn the last card in his deck. Yeah. And now Viper hits Fatigue first, crucially, because he hasn't been able to keep control of the board. He hasn't been able to Perplexing. just keep pushing that one damage every turn and get control. And now... Viper is looking in a mess. Yeah, it's starting to look very dire for him indeed. The long-term benefit of Hagatha definitely starting to shine through, even though in the immediate, Viper was looking to maybe dominate the board with a Searing Totem, just to get in that little bit of extra damage. For now, Gadan, as we started to get a better look at his deck, the Healing Rain knocking about in there as well, very easily counteracts that. That's not much. He needs higher impact than that. You must decide. And you now you see the big reason why these py this pyromancer and murmuring elemental just weren't being played previously. He just needed to pick up big, big options off them, off the Hagatha. 
And now the last card is a hex for Nalgadan. Blazing Invocation is going to be ripped. Can Nalgadan go out in style here? No. Oh. Hey, Prince Keleseth yeah, there's no, the rest of his deck. No two-cost minions in there. I mean, do you just pick Winshear Stormcaller because it's the biggest minion? The funny thing is, you could discover Keleseth here and it still wouldn't be the worst Keleseth discover we've seen. This week. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> Very nice. I will show you. Oh, hello. That is not bad at all. Even with limited access to low overload outside of obviously the volcano, which he probably doesn't want to play, it's not bad. He's assembling our dumb idea for a combo deck with Wind Fury and Spellstone. <laughs> well, let's let's not go into that. This right. cast has already taken a turn for the worse. Let's not tell them about Leroy OTK Shaman. Oh, they're not ready. Viper just going for throwing down any minion he, he can to, yeah. to generate a spell. Yeah. He Manatide, knows he's never winning this. Yeah, Manatide is just suicide here, but he just needs something. Yeah. Acolyte of Pain, same deal. But when this whips, we are going to finally, I imagine, see the concession from Viper. Ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, it's over. Now Gadan looked like he had it locked up 17 turns ago. Yeah. And then everything took a turn for the worse. The game set out for, t for fatigue, but he just identified in time that Viper had the stalemate correct. He reacted to it. He diverted his game plan. Derek, what a game. That was truly something else. I don't think I've ever witnessed a game like that in my life, casting Hearthstone. But for Viper, while it did come down to a pretty crazy scenario there, it does absolutely hinge on that one play he decided to make of Coin Shudderwalk on turn eight, when he had a couple of Saranites for one mana in his hand. He built the perfect scenario to give him the most likely chance of Shudderwalk, and he decided not to take it because he was afraid of one on turn nine from his opponent, and it just did not work out for him. It didn't. I'm, I'm just not even going to lie. This one's on me. I need a break. We will be <laughs> right back. The Hearthstone Championship Tour continues. It's go time! This is the 2018 Hearthstone Summer Championship. Esports scene in Hearthstone being as friendly and as interactive as it is, it, I would have to say is probably at least in part attributed to the fact that it really is intended to be a game for everyone. It's meant to be easy to learn, easy to get into. We always wanted Hearthstone to be kind of a warm, friendly, welcoming game. And although there is this competitive aspect to it, we strive to make the game very friendly. Oh, are you watching? Are you watching right now? Well, I, I think the vibe of Hearthstone itself is one about coming together. You know, it's about the tavern. It's about all these people, races coming together across time and space to enjoy a game of Hearthstone together. And I think that vibe actually really carries over into real life when you're playing Hearthstone. Stone. I think there's a lot of charm and whimsy to Hearthstone that kind of keeps it lighthearted. I think it's a little bit harder to get too tilted over something that's just like inherently a little bit goofy. It's legendary. There's also the fact that it's a single player it means there's not as much inner team conflict that can occur and you know negative play happens a player kind of knows you know oh I made a mistake or I'll keep that in mind I'll do better next time. It's very important to have really good practice partners um, in Hearthstone and 
especially if you want to be a competitive player and sharing ideas, sharing strategies. And a lot of what's best about Hearthstone is when you're playing with friends and, and, and trying to work together to solve the problem of a specific tournament. Despite it being like competitive, you still are having a great time with it and you still have moments that you laugh about. Sometimes cynically when, when all eight uh, missiles hit face or something. That's gonna happen to you, right? Like that's kind of what makes the game great in some respects. You're just having a lot of really cool Ragnaros shots hitting you and missing you and like having the bullet whiz by your head and hit your minion and like that oh, that heart palpitation going. And like that's, those moments are, are just core to Hearthstone, I think. Well, Derek, I don't know about you, but I've just about recovered from that game that we watched. And you're looking at Nelgadan, who you could see being visibly stressed there. But we managed to put something together to show exactly what was going through his mind while all of that madness was going on. Derek, it just goes to show how stressful that game was. You know, I made the joke that I needed a break after that one, but, you know, less about me. How are the players feeling after that? But now Gadan, he is one single game of Hearthstone away from qualifying through to the World Championships. If he can take this with his Taunt Druid, he's there. The first South American player to ever qualify through to the World Championships. A major victory, not only for him, but for his entire begin. continent, but he hasn't got there yet, and Viper has got himself a pretty respectable matchup to try and pull things back. And to add to all of that as well, Viper, sorry, now Gudan had himself in this exact position last year as well. When I say last year, I mean the last seasonal right. championship that occurred. It was summer championships back then. That was the last time we did one of these events, and now we're somehow all the way back at summer again. <laughs> now Gudan has qualified for those back to back, and last time he was in this exact spot and had it all snatched away by Dirty Rats and by Old Boy. So you can, just can't imagine putting yourself in his shoes, the stress that he's going for, but we at least got a, a little window of insight into how he was feeling during that game. But anyway, let's focus in. Torn Druid versus Big Spell Mage. The Cliff Notes version, Mr. Brown. I mean, I think as a basic rule, the, the first thing that obviously comes to mind is Polymorph for the big spell mage. Fantastic way to deal with a lot of the big taunts and obviously mess with the Witching Hour that uh, Nalgodan will be using to try and summon back his Hadronox. But generally, it's definitely not quite so simple as that because you can just make boards as the Taunt Druid, even just with your first Hadronox, that are simply too difficult for the mage to deal with. So that's definitely what Nalgodan is going to be trying to move towards, make an awkward board state for his opponent at one point in the game and then just close things out. Yeah, my experience from the Taunt Druid side of this, one of the big kickers is anti-magic shot uh, from, from Lich King because, you know, when you say you can make a big board that they can't deal with, that's true, but they can often deal with it over a couple of turns, right? They blizzard it, they lock it out, then they have the Flame Strike or even better, the Dragon's Fury into Flame Strike to then wipe it away. Suddenly, anti magic shell can just make an absolute mess of that situation and just force them to freeze your board once, freeze it again. That's the only two freezes they play in their deck outside of water elementals. Um, so, for me, Lich King is the linchpin in this matchup for Torn Druid. You really want to get that card rolling as soon as you can. You do indeed. But I just thought of that, by the way. That was pretty good. Thanks. Yeah, nice little half run. You got bars sold. Uh, but you very often only have one turn with a Lich King before it just gets straight up Polymorph. You're very rarely going to be resurrecting it with Hadronox whatsoever. So there's another kind of counterplay you can make as an important point to bring up in, that, in this matchup is baiting out Polymorphs. If you can put your opponent in a situation where they are under so much pressure that they have to use both Polymorphs before your Hadronox even comes down, then you end up in the very interesting situation where you can cube your Hadronox or even cube a Witching Hour after the Hadronox has been resurrected, which makes things an awful lot more difficult for the mage. Right. We saw Viper play this match uh, all the way back on day one. Seems a lifetime ago at this point. 
very greedy with his polymorph activation in, the ma in this very, very matchup. He was holding out for those cubes even that hit the Hadronox, feeling that he could deal with everything else. Yeah. Um, so it'll be interesting again to see how he chooses to allocate those removals, if he can even draw them on time, because right now, Nalgadan is ready to go for an 8-mana turn, and Viper does not have a polymorph in sight right now, meaning if there was a Lich King draw from Nalgadan, it could be fireworks. It could be very scary indeed, especially as Viper I mean, you were talking about last time being very conservative with his resources. This time, being just very liberal with them, throwing down the copy of Voodoo Doll there just to clear off a 3-6 on the board, which was not doing all too much at all. Do you think maybe he's learned his lesson? Is just trying to make sure he can't get snowballed at all here. It's hard to say. I believe he even won one of those games where he was going crazy late with his polymorphs. I mm. might be remembering that wrongly, but it's definitely a, a, a valid strategy, but it does potentially leave you very vulnerable to those kind of anti-magic shell uh, memes later on in the game, as well as other small oh, options that can beat you. I think this Arcane Keysmith, he would have been looking specifically for explosive runes first and foremost, because this turn eight is just terrifying coming out from Nalgadan here. If there is a Lich King, Viper would just be in a world of trouble right now. He's just got nothing against it. Yeah, he was really just looking for any other spell there to be, or a secret there, to be honest. Even a counter spell to get rid of the coin to maybe deny an Okar is not that ridiculous. And I suppose possibly if he could bait out with a spell vendor and naturalize away from a Hadronox, something like that could maybe be beneficial. But basically, outside of. Uh, a mirror entity there to copy a Lich King. There was very little that was good for him. Yeah. Mirror entity would have copied the Lich King and explosive runes would have damaged the Lich King to the point where the Keysmith at least contested it yeah. and had gave him the answer on the board. But yeah, outside of that, he did not have much game going on at all. <laughs> and still no polymorph in sight for Viper and Nalgadan is getting very close to being able to go off right now. It's not a huge Hadronox board. But it's a Hadronox board, and it's a dead Hadronox, which is not a given in this matchup. As Nalgadan is going to be starting to narrow down what these secrets could be. It's not Counter Spell, uh, it's not Explosive Runes, or Mirror Entity, or Vaporize, or Ice Barrier. I think he can narrow it down to pretty much exactly Spellbender at this point, which is fantastic for him, because he won't be falling into the trap of getting his Hadronox polymorphed, because he goes uh, Hadronox into Naturalize on the same turn. But Spellbender, though. Yeah, but he'll do something first. He'll swipe it. Like, right, or he can Got play it. around it, is what I have to say. So is this the turn, then, when you want to, if you're now Godan, continue to just test and break those unknown secrets for you? I mean, the thing is, though, in this situation, you kind of want Swipe to go on exactly the Lich King. Right. There it goes. Spellbender bites the dust. Viper did take it just for a little bit of disruption. Of course, it would make a complete mess of that naturalized play as we were talking about. Viper probably under no illusions that it was going to get that far to yep. still be hanging around to make that happen. But it's something that, you know, diverted Nalgadan's plan, made him have to do something different than just jamming that Hadronox, getting it in the pool with the Naturalize. Absolutely. But here for Nalgadan, I would argue not even that sad to see his taunt minions dying here because very often against the big spell mage, you can struggle with getting your large minions to actually go into the pool of dead taunts for Hadronox to resurrect. Whereas now, Nalgadan will have to start getting a threatening board very quickly indeed, as an on-curve Frostlich Jaina for Viper definitely starts to show he's going to be speeding up in this match. And that little play from Viper, the Keysmith taking the Spellbender, it gave him one more turn. It gave him one more turn to draw and play his Skulking Geist before that Hadronox Naturalize came down. He delayed Nalgadan for one turn to have to break that Spellbender, but he did not get paid out for it. He just has to make do with a poxy old Frostlich Jaina on curve instead. <laughs> As for Viper now, looking at the way this hand is working out for him, generally the way that the mage will struggle in this matchup is that they have to remove opposing decide. taunt boards with purely spells, which, as I've highlighted, often does not work out. You need some pretty precise combinations of spells 
like Blizzard into Flame Strike or Blizzard Blizzard Flame Strike even in some scenarios. All right. But in this scenario where now Godan hasn't doesn't have the ability to kill off his Hadronox mm, after the Witching Hour has been decide. played. Viper could start to dominate the board on his own purely with water elementals. As long as he doesn't let himself get surprise oh, lethal by his opponent now. through some kind of branching path nonsense, he's looking pretty good. And there it is. The fact that Viper kind of has a face-up polymorph in, a, in essence, because by, uh, now right. Gudan knows that it's in hand, is pretty good for him because yeah. it will just scare now Gudan away from ever trying to risk a witching it. And I suppose, arguably, if he did try and risk it, you could just polymorph it, which works out well for you. But it just slows the game down very nicely. So you were saying? <laughs> yeah. More fool me that yeah, now Gudan manages to pick up the perfect card. Right, I, I do somewhat wonder, like, is his... Um, is his taunt pool good hmm. enough right now to be going off on Witching Hour Q? Because it's a lot of Ironwood Golem right now. Yeah. He does not really want a lot of Ironwood Golem in this matchup. There's a Primordial Drake in hand that is actually really good against this board state. I think it's probably worth getting that one more bigger taunt into the uh, into the pool. Speaking of getting taunts in your pool, by the way, despite how the animations looked on the previous turn, I think those both were natural picks from Viper. I believe if you time out on the Discover Choice, it just takes the far left option, and the Sunwalker right. was the far right. Time waits for no one. So I think he did manage to get in everything he needed to do, did Viper on the previous turn. But yeah, I do like this play from Now Gadan. I agree. Definitely easy to get suckered in by that uh, Witching Hour Q play, but he knows that he gets back aboard with a good chunk of Ironwood Golem in it, and he knows that his cube gets polymorphed after the fact. So he needs to make a board that wins the game off this one play. And Ironwood Golems just aren't cutting it. I wouldn't be surprised to see him keep waiting for, for Lich Kings, for Sleepy Dragons, even from here. That was going to be my extension of your argument there. Like, do you just wait forever until you get some of the bigger cards like Lich King and the Sleepy mm. Dragon as for Viper? He's just going to start winning this board, at which point, you know, you can get yourself a nice big board with maybe one more Lich King in there, one more Sleepy Dragon. Yeah. But the extra three, four, five attack that that generates onto a board for you, can that possibly be worth it? Basically, no matter what it is for now, Godan here, he's going to have to hope for a pretty specific set of cards that are not in his opponent's hand. Right. Yeah, now Godan. Not messing about, but it looks like just going to go straight down the cube route. But yeah, the scary part of this is that he just knows. He knows that there aren't two more Hadronox after yeah. this play. He knows this is just the board state. Three Ironwood Golems. That feels absolutely dreadful. As I mentioned, the Lich King very often not resurrected by Hadronox because it just gets polymorphed. But here for Viper, it's not even necessary. His opponent just has a terrible board of taunts. And there's the play. Blizzard to stall and set yourself up for the Dragon's Fury on the next turn. And because we haven't got to Lich King yet, now Gadan has no way to try and disrupt this. Cube, I suppose, is an interesting way of trying to mess with what your opponent's doing, because obviously it gives you, as Cube always does, some resilience to a complete board wipe. Right. And for now, Godan, it's going to have to be some kind of a creative play in this scenario, because I think if the game just plays out in the standard way we're both expecting, where he relies on a 50-50 from Witching Hour, Viper should just win. Maybe. If he hits the 50-50, does now Godan, then it becomes interesting, because as the Spellstone being drawn has just reminded me, he has not yet been geisted, so he does have a natural way to destroy that uh, that second Witching Hour Hadronox if he does pick up the 50-50. But he has to find it right now because Viper just goes Dragon's Fury into Dragon Caller Alana on the following turn. Sure. And just destroys his opponent, or at the very least, makes so many big minions that he can trade into a Hadronox board and then doesn't actually do enough to kill Viper. You are correct, sir. And even in the worst case scenario for Viper, if he gets a Polymorph, is that that bad? That's two less primordial drakes that have then died on board, which means a Hadronox, if it were to come back, would just be like five Ironwood Golems.
And I guess wondering if he does even need to go for it at all, because he will be thinking of the exact possibility with only seven cards left in his opponent's deck of second Witching Hour into the Carnivorous Cube. But I think he's realizing if he does get the very unlikely scenario of the 50-50 cube and having it in hand and Carnivorous Cube all in one turn, it's worth to take the much more likely odds that you can just go Dragon's Fury into Dragon Caller Alarm. Yep. There is the Meteor. He's going to drop the Snobbish Engineer down alongside this now as well. Having nailed the sweep. Play a little quickly there. Maybe the Doomsayer off the Novice Engineer was a stronger play than the uh, the Raven Familiar. I think that just opens you up to straight up, um, without even the need for a cube, just witching. Oh, you're out. so right. You are yeah. so right. Yeah, my mistake. I just got excited wanting to set up an Alana. <laughs> it's like, I want to tempo a nine drop next turn. Let's play this Doomsayer and just lose the game. I mean, that is the late game combo. That's what Doomsayer is for right. in the late game yeah. for this deck. It's to set up Alana. Now for now, Gudan, he really wants to be holding on to these branching paths because with the way it currently stands, his board of taunt minions will be very unimpressive. A lot of Ironwood Golems in there. And so when he does get it back, if he can get any minions to stick, the plus four attack buff that he could get off of the branching paths may be absolutely crucial. Now Kadan just still has a good Okar. Like, with, with four <laughs> cards remaining in his deck, his card's just still fine. Why do you exist? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's fine, but it's not great. It's probably not it's good enough. Let's be real. Change my mind, this card sucks. Time melts away. Was this now Gadan's thinking though? Just get enough competition on the board that maybe he can live a, a turn yeah. if Alana comes down? Like maybe he can just grind through with swipe and branching paths. I mean it's just hoping that Viper mm. somehow I messes up. Decide. Like he sticks a board of reasonable minions, double branching paths buff to close out the game. Yeah. And with Umbra in play, right, that's another activator for, for Nalgadan's side. That's true. It's, it's saying to Viper, hey, if you want to spend your nine mana on your Alana this turn, well, there is a real spooky minion that you have uh, potentially created mm. insane things with Hadronox Q. Yeah. Which is, I think, why Viper is taking so long, because one of the big possibilities he's considering here, I think, is just straight up Doom Pack to clear off the board, because these are very threatening minions. In the end, just going to clear off that Umbra. He knows how scary it is. He was also thinking about Polymorph, because maybe preemptively making that Witching Hour less likely to That's activate show, is yeah. even more important. Yeah. And even just if there wasn't a Witching Hour, if the Umbra had been left up, just cube on Master Okar is not that bad. That's a pretty scary board you've all of a sudden generated. Yep. Yeah, when I said it was powerful with you know, Witching Hour and Cube, I didn't mean in combination. Right. Because that's just o that's just overkill, right? Yeah. You don't have enough board space to make all that happen. But either or in that spot would have been fantastic if Umbra was left alive. I think as Nalgadan starts to see this game slipping out of his fingers, might be going for the branching paths just to draw a couple more cards and try and find that Witching Hour 100% on the very next turn. We can still activate it with the naturalize here, right? If he even if he draws it. Time waits for no one. That is nothing. I mean he can now guarantee witching hour on the following turn. Out of cards. There finally is the Lich King. Second from last. Just swipe Wrath to clear the board, keeping what board state he has, deals with the Baron Geddon. Viper now has that freedom. Freedom for Alana to hit the board. I, I don't think he even needs to go for that because he's got an unbeatable combo where he has Polymorph for a cube with Hadronoxes inside it. And then you can just go for Doom Pack to clear off the board. And even though he's destroyed every card in the deck there, sure. now Godan has no counterplay to Dragon Caller Alana. Time melts away. I agree with all of your words. Mr. Brown. Now Godard doesn't have any counterplay for Dragon Caller Alana right now. Outside of 
what, Lich King into a Doom Pact of his own? Sure. But then he's probably just dead because he has to then spend a turn. Yeah. We're exactly. doing this thing that <laughs> casters do where we argue over two different lines in a 100% one game. Yeah. The time is now. And Viper, or having that exact argument in his head, in actually both of our voices as well. It's very odd. That's probably why he looks so kind of not infused all the time. Yeah, I mean, I have to listen to myself in my own head all the time, and I look uninfused all the time as well, so the story checks out. Quite emphatically uninfused, actually, I would say. Fitty fitty! Oh! Bam. There was it, it worth it? Was it worth <laughs> wait for all 30 cards? <laughs> Just a ripper sheep. And there it is. Go on, let's hear some noise for a sheep. There we go. Someone is very passionate about sheep I in the was audience. Say, there was like barking somewhere along the lines. Someone's just got the wrong animal entirely. Never mind. All right. Two games to two. This series is stretching it out to the absolute limit, which means, of course, Derek, it's going to end up on this game number five. What matchup do we have left? Now, good answer. Druid versus Viper's Shaman. That's exactly right. The Shadowwalk Shaman up against the Taunt Druid, one of the absolute key matchups of HCT Summer Championships thus far. We've seen it multiple times go one way or the other. And I mean, as with any game of Hearthstone, you can always say anything can happen, but I would have to double say that with Shudderwalk Shaman. Some truly absurd things have happened, even just in this series alone. Yeah, some truly absurd things can happen, and we watched literally all of the <laughs> last game just condensed into one 40-minute hell ride of a game. Yeah. <laughs> good good, Pretty good much. talk. There are, there are no words to say about that game. There's very few words to say about this series, but many words to say about the position that hammer. these players find themselves in. Because for now, Gradan, again, this is the last game. Win or go home. Qualify to the World Championships after finding himself in exactly this position in the Summer Championships last year. Or see it all crumbling down before his very eyes instead. And seeing the stoic German Viper take his spot. Stoic though he may be, turning his... Eyes up to the heavens there, just hoping. Surely this has to be his time to get through to the summer champions, to the world finals, sorry. Full mulligan. Makes sense. Looking for, I would argue, pretty much exactly Manatai Totem as one of the first cards because you can really punish the fact that Druid is mulliganing exclusively for ramp. Oh pretty much. If they're doing nothing in their early turns, you can really get a nice quick start and draw a lot of cards off of Manatide. And I mean, Darrow, like, this hand for Nalgadan, is this one of the worst possible hands or one of the best possible hands he could have? <laughs> I think we'll meet in the middle. Okay. It could absolutely get the job done. Obviously, if we look at the build he's got here, two Dragon Hatches and only one Sleepy Dragon. So he still could get a very powerful copy of Master Oakar, as long as he does not draw another dragon here. And he's got a fair few turns to do so. like this. He's still like three or four turns away from it with Nourish into turn eight into Oakar. Now Viper has options get some guaranteed cycle off his Acolyte <laughs> Pain here, which I do like. Yeah. To me. Uh, the Manatai can come later. He does choose to hold on to the coin here. He's just leaving it on the board. He's saying, this is a very attractive swipe for my opponent. But then if my opponent swipes, guess what? Manatai Totem follows that all up afterwards. There you go. He's been breaking his curve to keep out with that Manatai Totem. He knows that he has some time in this matchup, doesn't value the mana efficiency of the Life Drinker. This was the setup. Holds onto his coin, drops the Acolyte, sacrifices it to the Gods of Swipe, 
instead gets maximum value out of that mana type. And I think I like this a little bit more taking a second look at it because Mana Tide to me is slightly more controlled card draw. You know exactly what you're getting in one card a turn. Whereas with Acolyte of Pain, if he was to see something like Wrath Spellstone with a Naturalize perhaps even, <laughs> there was the potential for that clip you've all seen, I'm sure, about 50,000 times. It's still good! Of Sintelol burning his key card. And while we do see Shadowwalk in hand, Rumble being burned, something important like that, could be very devastating. So Viper here, all in on making sure he cannot have those key cards burned. But still, he ends up with, what, nine cards in hand? It's a relatively safe turn, I think, to leave yourself vulnerable to a naturalize yep. from your opponent, because going into eight and going into nine against uh, Taunt Druid, no. they just want to play an eight drop and yep. a nine drop. That's just what they want to do. And it's very hard to convince them to do otherwise, no matter how juicy a proposition you present. Oh, oh. As the second copy of Dragon Hatcher is oh, found. Oh, Gadar, not like this. This is unbelievable. He draws Hadronox, two dragons, and both dragon hatchers with a Master Oakheart in hand. If he plays that now, it fetches only an Ironwood Golem. Hmm, I wonder. Fluffy, snuggle, fetch! Fortunately, Fluffy and Four Snuggles is still remaining in the deck, so he can still generate a board. But this is heartbreaking for Nalgadan. Again, the, the hidden information that Nalgadan is relying on here with the Dragon Hatcher could make Viper play in a somewhat awkward fashion because he obviously does not know that the Sleepy Dragon is not uh, is in hand for Nalgodan. Right. So potentially baiting out one of the powerful cards here like Volcano or Hex, or more likely, I suppose, an Earthshock. Although even that is a very valuable card against something like a Cube or a Hadronox later on in the game. And it sounds like a ridiculous thing to say to look at it, but this is about as intense and engaged as I have seen, seen Viper over all four of the days. Lent forward, head in hands. He's been pretty much in the same pose throughout all of his games, which is just lent back, looking very, very calm and carefree. But now suddenly even he oh, is feeling time. these stakes piling up on top of him. I mean, how it sounds it? delicious now that I think. <laughs> <laughs> you want to feel the stakes piling up on top of you? But for Viper here, it's, it would be impossible to not feel the pressure here forever. So much on the line in this one game, qualifying through to the World Championships. We've seen what that can do for a player's career. Now, looking at the plays for now, Godan, pretty much everything looks rather underwhelming. A Sleepy Dragon here is the best threat he can throw down. But what does that actually do to throw him back on the board? Oh, that's a grumble with a Black Knight on the board. Oh, I need a moment. <laughs> that's so disgustingly good. He just needs to make sure he has room in his hand. Well, also, here's the thing. Is it a bait, though? Because you would end up grumbling zero Saranite Chain Gangs and zero Murmuring Elementals which means you give yourself just about the lowest possible odds of repeated shutter walks later in the game. That is a true fact. It might be a trap. This might be too good to be true, Darren. It's just such a big tempo swing though. And I think Viper, as I would agree with him here, is realizing this is not one of those matchups in which you have all the time in the world to give yourself the absolute best sure. possible grumble turn. I think part of the Black Knight tech coming into the deck is to enable situations like this, right? Where you don't need the Shadowwalk OTK to win the game. You can just nuke their board with Black Knights and Glacial Shards and it's That's good right. enough. Yeah, it's not only the immediate benefit you get from Black Knight, as you pointed out. Even if he just plays one Shadowwalk, freezes their whole board, blows half of it up with Black Knights, that will probably just win him the game anyway. This is desperation now for Nalgadan. Just has to go fishing. He needs an activated Hadronox sooner rather than later at this point. Cube is not it. It's too expensive on the first activation. And now with additional tools like Earthshock. He's one damage off lethal, he I think. He is one damage off lethal if Nalgadan plays a single Torn here. And what does Nalgadan do outside of that? Does he just go for 
Branching Paths, mm. Oaken Summons. Branching Paths could be really good to push that damage later on in the game. For no one. But he has to make some kind of a really defensive play or he will just die. Roaring now with the Branching Paths. Witching Hour is still nothing at this point as well. Branching Paths number two. Really needs that naturalize. Ooh. Doesn't even manage to hit a taunt off of the Oaken Summons. And now he will be, what, seven damage off of dying? Which is really not a position you want to be in. That armor gain ends up being crucial, though, because he was just dead to Shudderwalk mm, yeah. at this point. Just the life trinker going off. And for Viper, if his Shudderwalk, uh, if his Grumble survives on board for one more turn, he can just go Shudderwalk and play the one mana Grumble afterwards, at which point he just has a one mana Shudderwalk in hand. Fair point. Which means now Gadan has to develop his own board, put up a defensive measure in the form of Taunts or Health, and clear his opponent's board all in one turn. And I'm just not seeing how it's possible. Time. Just cycling the Ancestral Healing essentially here, just rebuffing this Black Knight. Glacial Shard comes out just for a bit of extra freezing power in case he needs it on the following turn against the Hadronox board coming down. And again, it feels horrible to say this, but is Nalgadan's dream slipping away from him at the final hurdle one last time? most important game of his life since the last most important game of his life. He just has to draw here. Nothing else even comes close to keeping him alive. And I don't think there's anything left in his deck that can do it for six mana. Armor's just not going to cut it here, but you're right, the options just aren't there for Nalgadan to find answers in his deck. Takes the armor, cycles the wrath now, looking for an out, finds Spellstone, but it's unbuffed. Time waits for no one. If he'd have wrathed first, the Spellstone can come into hand and then the branching paths. It's all very niche and it looks like Nalgadan, at least visually, has conceded there. Game number five is gone over to Viper. Nalgadan, again, your heart goes out to the Argentinian. Came so close again and yet still so far from that World Championship appearance. But again, it's Europe booking the second of two spots in the World Championship so far. Huge congratulations to Viper there as we finally get to see a smile on his little face and it's a well-deserved one indeed, despite one of the craziest Shudderwalk Shaman mirrors I've ever seen. Very questionable play in there, but overall, I could not be happier for Viper here. Yeah, and they see it. A8, Viper, the two European representatives joined by Killin all day and without much further ado, Viper is standing by to talk us through that insane series with Cora. Our first five game series of the day and Viper is moving on to the Hearthstone World Championships. What's going through your head right now? Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy. Like, I, this, is a, this is the next win, I win worlds. I, I, I don't find any words to describe how happy I am. <laughs> a little bit choked up. Well, nothing wrong with that. I do, of course, have to ask because there were some really wild moments in that series. The Shutterwalk Mirror in particular, I'm not gonna ask about specifics. I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna make you relive it, but I just wanna know where was your head at after that game? Because that was, you know, that was a rough one. I think my next thought was, yeah, okay. If you lose the Mage versus Druid game now, then nothing mattered. If you win this one and then lose the next one, like, I don't wanna <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it, it, it turned out good, but yeah, I wanna forget about that game. It's okay, the end result is good. You're going to Worlds, it doesn't matter. Final question, all of the people that have helped you along the way, practice partners, your team, now's the opportunity, give them some shout outs. What do you have to say? I, the biggest shout outs always to my practice partners, the guys that helped me come up with the lineup, like always there for me. First of all, there's Casey, there's Bunny Hopper. I hope he will make it as well, like in the next game. 
Then there's Konmari, he was super helpful with the exactly this lineup. Then there's always the hashtag Deutsche Zocker Gilde. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's all my friends and they're always there. Special, especially from the, those guys, it's Sinto, Psycho Law, Sinto Law, Psycho, <laughs> Nixley, Moyen, I don't know, they are great, they're always there for me, it's super great. And last but not least, there's like, I don't know, shout outs to my team Genji mates. Like, <laughs> I mean, I also said Sunto Psycho, oh, practicing a lot with them. And they're also Dev Steve Rossi. I don't know, like just great guys, always helpful, always there. It's super. Great, great group of guys. And all of the hard work has paid off. Let's hear it for Viper. He's going to the Hearthstone World Championships. Congratulations again. Good luck in your semifinal match. But we have one more decider match of the day. Our final member of the top four is going to be either Bunny Hopper or Turna. So let's get ready.